Kristen, right, you start everybody. the recording? Yes, yeah, I have a question. Yeah, if you could get started. Um, thank you for joining us tonight. Um, my name is Tina Mazikane. I'm the K-12 Mathematics Coordinator here at the Virginia Department of Education. Uh, we, um, we have you here tonight for um, one in a series of fall webinars that we're doing for mathematics. Um, this first one is titled Addressing Unfinished Learning in the Secondary Mathematics Classroom. Uh, we're happy to have with us um, two of my colleagues, um, Deb Delosier. She's a mathematics specialist here at the Virginia Department of Education. And Kristen Williams-Foss, she's a mathematics and special education specialist. And we make up the math um, department at the Virginia Department of Education. So we are, all three of us are very glad to spend some time with you all this evening. Um, a few of you were with us last night when we um, encountered some some pretty heavy thunderstorms. So we um, we were hoping tonight the skies will be clear and it's very sunny here right now. So we won't have any issues with uh, power outages. Um, but tonight we plan on um, looking at bridging to um, to new learning. So what does that mean um, in terms of uh, thinking about um, helping students bridge from that unfinished learning um, that we know many of them are coming to us um, and and uh, if since this past pandemic year and into some new learning um, and then how do we how do we think about just in time instruction what does that look like uh, for our students and what kind of resources are available we're going to talk about a lot of different resources from the Virginia Department of Education tonight some you may be familiar with and some you may not be so uh, we welcome you and um, and hope that you uh, you enjoy tonight's presentation so we'd like to start by hearing a little bit from you. Um, we, we know that we've been thinking a lot about the next upcoming school year, and we hope that um, you can help us to start to think about it. What are your initial plans for addressing unfinished learning? Um, Kristen has put a link in the chat, um, so we'll be using the chat quite a bit today to uh, correspond with you and put links in there. Um, but if you could click on that link to the Padlet, and the Padlet allows you to uh, you should be able to click right in there and start uh, typing a little message for all of us to, to look at. So we'll give you a second to um, get clicked on that link and try and get into the Padlet. And we would like to hear about your plans for addressing um, the learning of your students that might need to be filled in from, from this current school year into the next. So we're hoping that you all can get in there and add some of your comments. So it looks like um, creating a safe learning environment. Yes, where students feel comfortable exploring ideas and asking questions. Uh, small frequent pre-assessments. Um, Self-checking Desmos practice embedded in, with refresher videos, great. Um, Pre-testing, establishing routines. Now they're starting to pop in here. Mm -hmm. Push teachers into classrooms after school and before school tutoring. Um, talk to the previous teacher to see where they left off and um, thinking about some of those areas that they really struggled with, great. Working on basic integer operations and math facts. Calibrate daily learning targets and adjust pacing as necessary. Great. Using Kahoot and Quiz as informal assessments to gauge where the students are. Uh, spiraling for warm ups. I see that. Um, just in time quick checks. We'll be talking a little bit about those tonight. Um, the Desmos things, we'll be talking about that for sure. 
daily remediation blocks, um, baseline testing to see where they are. Well, awesome, lots of great ideas, lots of things I know you all have been thinking about just as we've been thinking um, to think about all those foundational skills and things that, that we really hope that our students come to us with next year, but know that there's gonna be some space um, where we're going to have to, to just plan a little bit of extra instruction to, to get them get them moving forward. So thank you for your ideas and please continue to, to, to share them if you haven't yet got, gotten a chance to get in that Padlet so we can continue to look at everybody else's ideas, but we're gonna continue forward. Uh, we know that as you've been um, going through this previous school year, you've probably read a lot and have seen things on the internet about how students are falling behind and how there's going to be significant academic learning loss or the kids' math skills are going to take a huge hit from the pandemic. And we really want um, to encourage you to think about the idea that we need to have more of an asset-based um, um, mindset about what students are coming to us with next year versus this deficit um, mindset that's easy to get into because we do know that there, there has been some learning that kids, the kids have, have not been encountering. Um, but students are going to feel um, our anxiety if, if we feel like, oh, they're so far behind and it's going to take forever for us to get them to catch up. If that's our mindset, kids are going to pick up on that. But if our mindset is, we know there's things that you're going to come to us this year having not learned from last year. And when we get to the spot where we're learning something new and we know that you need some, some pr prior knowledge that, that you may not have, we're going to make sure that we get you um, where you need to be. So, so those mindsets are going to be very important. Um, and and we, we encourage you to think instead about learning loss, thinking about how am I going to bridge my kids into this new learning for the upcoming school year? And what's that going to look like? So our session tonight is really going to be centered around that idea of bridging to new learning and mathematics. Um, and when we think about that, we think about... Um, we're in our current grade or our current course that we're teaching in mathematics, and we're gonna have to sometimes create this bridge across from where that unfinished learning is from that previous grade or course. And sometimes that unfinished learning can happen not just one grade level or course behind us, but it could be you know two grade levels behind. So we're gonna show you some resources tonight that might help you be able to think about what that unfinished learning might be and how you can fold um, some of that into your current instruction. So we want to just talk about the difference between remediation and bridging to new learning. There is some distinctions between the two. So when we remediate, we really spend a lot of time in that below grade level content. Um, and we, we feel like we have to teach all of this before we can move to new learning. Um, but with bridging to new learning, we want you to start the school year with your new, your new content. And we want you to think about how do you connect the unfinished learning into the context of that new learning. So when we remediate, we cover a lot of standards prior to, the, to that current grade level. But we want you to think about how do you integrate those into, um, into your current uh, instruction and just maybe integrating a few lessons from prior grades or, or prior units. Um, as we remediate, we, we usually isolate from the grade appropriate learning, um, but, but we want to have that more just in time sort of approach to learning, whether you're in a core academic setting where students are, are you know, getting that, that tier one um, instruction or whether it's some sort of an extended time where kids are getting some extra, extra um, instruction. How do we make sure that that's just in time, that that's addressing what they're learning at that moment in that, that grade level or course? And then remediation oftentimes focuses on that procedural fluency. Maybe they just didn't really understand about how to solve this equation, or they didn't understand how to do this procedure. But oftentimes, if we think about addressing the conceptual understanding, that helps us to create that bridge uh, from the learning that they're missing into that new learning. And it also helps them to think about how they can apply that learning um, um, in that new setting. So, so this um, information comes from a, um, a resource um, called TNTP. It's a learning acceleration um, article that we had looked at. Um, we're going to share this um, presentation with you towards the end of the presentation. So you'll have all these links available to you um, so that you can check that out. There's quite a bit of good information in there. 
So one thing we wanted to mention to you are um, what we're calling bridging documents. We had these um, available in the 2019-2020 school year at the very end of the year when the pandemic started. Um, and then we've created new ones for, for the upcoming school year. And what these are, they're very simple documents. It's just basically, if I'm teaching um, Algebra 1 next year, I might want to converse with the eighth grade teacher um, from where my students might be rising from and think about, is there anything that you that you didn't get to last year? Or is there some content that maybe you, you touched on it, but it really wasn't at the depth that you know that it needed to be? Um, and that allows you to, to do a few different things. Number one, it allows you to think about your pacing for this year. If all those kids didn't get instruction in a certain area, you may need to make sure you build in a little bit of extra time for, for the content that's gonna build on that particular skill. Um, and it also allows you to think about um, how, the, how the content is articulating as you move forward. Um, so you can start to really think about um, you know, what's important um, in my grade level or course and what can I connect um, from other areas of that course so that I can be more efficient in how I'm using my time. Um, and we know that there's going to be students in your classroom um, that may not have been in the class prior to, 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 to that particular year in, in a different school or even a different state. But um, this at least gives you a basic background about how you can start to address um, instruction for the upcoming school year. Um, Kristen did put a link to the tracking logs in um, the, uh, the chat box. So if you want to click on that, you can check them out a little bit further. But we're interested in, in finding out and if you've all used these tracking logs. Um, they've been out for a couple of years. If, if you have, can you just type in the chat in what ways have you utilized the tracking logs and, um, and enter your thoughts in the chat box. So Kimberly said she's never used them. Awesome, so hopefully you'll check them out and see uh, if it's something you might be able to utilize. So many of you haven't used them. Somebody used them at the end of 2019 and passed the info on to the, the, the appropriate teachers. Um, used them for lesson planning and vertical planning, um, used it as a way to make sure um, I hit the information that was maybe missed, um, talked about them during collaboration over the summer, uh, looking at them when planning for this year. Um, many of you who haven't used them, some, some folks in our other sessions said they used them to think about summer school this year, which I thought was kind of a good, a good idea. Um, first year teacher Mallory, Awesome, good luck this year. We wish you the best. Um, can you please put the Padlet link in the chat again? Sure, Nicole, we can add the Padlet for you. Um, use them after assessments to try and plan for future units and spiral reviews, awesome. So we're glad to see that some of you have, have found this resource, um, but that's kind of the purpose of today's session. There might be some resources that have been out there that you just are not familiar with. So we're gonna share several different resources tonight in addition to these tracking logs. And hopefully that will help guide you um, to think a little bit more about how you can be efficient in, in your instruction. So we're going to uh, move forward and Kristen is going to start um, talking to you a little bit more about bridging to unfinished learning and what that really means. Actually, Deb's going to start talking. About ah, it's, I'm it's sorry, Deb, it's your turn. <laughs> we're flipping it up for you. We're switching it around. Um, so we are going to talk about bridging unfinished learning to new learning. And really, if you think about it, we've always had to do this, right? Every school year when the school year starts, we have to think about what our students are bringing to us, what they still need. So we definitely have our work cut out for us this year because of the pandemic and the circumstances that it presented. But um, we want to share with you, if you've not already seen, information about the Virginia Learns Guidance documents. So this document was released in April of 2021, and it was titled Navigate education in uncertain times, but it provided recommendations and provided resources around best practices related to equity, curricula, remediation, intervention, assessment, data analysis, etc. And so Kristen, if you go ahead to the next screen, um, you will you will notice uh, the picture on the right 
is a picture of what the document actually looks like if you were to print it out or if you go to the web page. But this information was uh, a, a shoot off, if you will, or based upon or built upon the former information that was distributed back in, I believe it was April of 2020, which was the recovery design and restart work. Um, and so it was really meant to be a resource for teachers and the stakeholders uh, that were involved I actually helped uh, in creating an FAQ that is also posted on our webpage, but it's here in the links. And we will be sharing this presentation with you a little later this evening. Uh, but those FAQs change often because as you see, guidance changes often. So uh, those are our um, resources that you may want to take a look at. The Virginia Learns document, however, has eight sections, and those eight sections um, are, are highlighted on the next two slides. So we've got the data dashboard, and that dashboard provides uh, different feedback that was received from stakeholders that helped to guide the work of the committee that worked on the Virginia Learns documents. Uh, but there's a section on equity, and there these are resources that uh, all teachers and school divisions can utilize as they look at ensuring that equitable access for all students um, is, is created. There are various checkpoints and there's an early childhood section as well. And on the next slide, you'll notice we get in, into the content more. So you'll see a section in, on language arts, a section on bridging mathematics, and that's the focus for tonight's session. We'll be talking a lot about the bridging mathematics standards documents and where you can find those, what they consist of, and how they might help you moving forward. There's also a section on navig te technology navigation, checking systems, and a federal pandemic relief funding uh, information section. So let's go ahead and dive in a little bit deeper into the Bridging Math Standards documents. When you click on the Virginia Learns document and you go to, uh, I think it's page 46, uh, you will see uh, this page and you will notice that there are some trucks on a highway here. And so each of the trucks is labeled with a particular grade level. And Kristen is gonna put in the chat box for us a link uh, probably she'll use the instructional page link, which will take you more directly to the bridging standards documents. Uh, but when she does that, and when you have a chance, go ahead and click on that and pull up one of the bridging math uh, standards documents, a grade level that you work most closely with or that you're most interested in. And we're gonna talk for just a moment before we dive a little deeper into what a bridging standard really is. So what do we mean when we talk about bridging standards? When the math team identified uh, the bridging standards that you'll find in these documents, we were really using three pieces of criteria to determine what made a standard a bridging standard. Uh, and these criteria, a, a bridging standard could uh, represent one or more of these criteria, okay? So they function as a bridge to which other content within the grade level or the course is connected. And that could be either horizontally or vertically. They serve as prerequisite knowledge for content that'll be addressed in a future grade or future courses. And or they possess endurance beyond a single unit of instruction within a grade or course. So we wanna spend a little bit of time in just a moment uh, having you really dive deeper into the bridging standards document, but I wanted to share with you on the screen what that looks like. So you'll notice um, here, we want you to be thinking about what information can be found in the bridging document and how might these uh, resources be utilized in your classroom. Uh, in the chat, you've already, you hopefully have found the link that Kristen has, has placed and you would scroll down just past the tracking logs to locate the bridging documents. And Kristen, if you go ahead and take us to the next slide, we're gonna ask you to take a few minutes to, to explore one of the bridging documents and think about what you notice about the bridging documents and use the chat to record some of what you're noticing. So go ahead and take a moment to pick one of the grade levels to explore and tell us what you're noticing about the bridging documents. 
And, and we know that we have um, a lot of high school folks with us tonight. So if you teach um, algebra one or above, you may wanna pull up the grade eight document. It, it gives a nice little sequence of, of the, the skills and knowledge that, that students um, you know, in, in eighth grade and what, what's coming before that um, possess. So um, these are only up, th up through eighth grade, but that eighth grade one can, can certainly be of help. So we, we encourage you to check that one out. Right, so Megan is noticing that the documents include the standards for two grade levels before. So it shows that prerequisite knowledge that students would be bringing to the grade level content. Sue noticed that they are organized by big ideas. So those big ideas are color coded. Organized by concepts. Oh, they look, Lynette says they look very similar to their district's pacing guide. They may be, they may be uh, in a scope and sequence that's similar to your pacing guide, or they might not be. They're not intended necessarily to be in order of what you might be teaching. That truly is uh, a decision that schools and uh, districts will make. But, um, but there's a, a, quite a bit of information there. The connections to vertical standards, Stephanie noticed each way up and down prior grade SOLs, which helps you to see that progression, doesn't it? So we're gonna spend a little more time as we move forward tonight, looking at how you might utilize these uh, particular documents. Oh, I forgot the next question, right? I, I forgot to ask, what are you wondering? So are there questions that you have as you look at these documents, what is it that you're wondering about? Are there any questions that you have as you um, preview these documents? Where are the bridging documents for Algebra 1? What do the colors mean in the possible grade 6? So we actually might want to address that one in terms of how the color codes are. Um, you'll notice. Right, I thought if you go to the next, if you go to the next slide, Kristen, that might be a good place. Okay, to yeah, do you can that. describe it with this you one. Know, yep. Oh, okay. Well, I mean, you don't have one pulled up, do you? Um, no, I don't. All right, I have four. Oh, that won't help you. <laughs> But I can go back to the uh, I can go back to the screen before I've already had a picture of it. So um, one of the questions was how the color coding works. So you'll notice that each of the content area content focus areas have different colors. And then when you look at the grade level connections, the possible grade level connections, um, and then those are color coded. So for example, in this grade seven one that we're looking at on the screen, um, in the content focus area of applying rational numbers, that's color coded red. If we're looking at the SOL 7, 1, E and D in terms of absolute value and square roots and perfect squares, those, those concepts could be connected really well with uh, evaluating algebraic expressions, which is in the black content area focus. So it's, they're not all the possible content connections, but they're just ideas of where you can be really strategic in your planning and where you can kind of get the most bang for your buck and make connections across different focus areas. So it would be a perfect time to you know, integrate the perfect squares and square roots and absolute value when you're evaluating algebraic expressions. So that's what the purpose of those color codes are. Thank you, Kristen, so much for the, that explanation. Some of you noticed that the bridging standards are represented in bold. So when you look at the uh, bridging standard document, the bridging standards are the ones that are, are bolded. And um, if you click on the either column to the left of the standard. So, you know, right down the middle is the standards for that particular grade level. Uh, if you look just to the left, you'll see those related prerequisite skills. And when you click on any of those pieces, and you may have tried this already, when you click on any of those, whether it be the grade level standard or the prerequisite skills, 
those standards will take you right to the just-in-time quick check resources. And so we are going to talk some about the, those tonight as well. Um, I think I got everything um, that folks were sharing and that we wanted to be sure to connect to. Okay, so we're ready to move on. So let's take a and I'll, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, I think some of the questions that were posed, we will be addressing throughout. So. And and one of the ones that um, I I know that that has been asked a couple times is about you know are we going to have these for for the high school um, end of course um, grade levels or courses and and the decision was made not to make bridging documents for 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 algebra one geometry and algebra two because the um, the strands in those courses don't don't really vertically articulate as well as they do in the in the in the K through eight grade levels. Um, but we do encourage you to use the the math vertical um, articulation tool because that does make some connections um, across the alg algebraic strands, which could be helpful in geometric strands for those courses. So um, I'll put the link in the chat so you can um, take a look at that. Um, we know that we know that um, you know it's difficult not to sometimes to have those for the high school courses. So we wanted you to make sure you, that there are resources. And Tina, are those uh connections to prior content included in the secondary uh, checks for Algebra 1, Geometry, Algebra 2? There or are, um, in the, yeah, in the just-in-time quick checks, there are um, prior knowledge um, is, is mentioned in those. So there is some vertical articulation that extends from those as well. So that that's, that's available. Also a good tool. OK, good. So let's spend just a moment uh, diving a little deeper into how you might utilize these new documents that have been created. Let's take a, take a look at an example of how an eighth grade teacher might utilize the bridging document. It may be that the teacher is planning to engage students in a lesson or lessons that focus on SOL 816A, which is slope and linear functions. The teacher might want to check on the prior knowledge that students are bringing to this content and determine whether they have familiarity with standard 710A, which is understanding slope as a rate of change in a proportional relationship. And so, as I mentioned, the column directly to the left of the grade level standard links the QCs from that prior grade. So I could click on that link, and I'm, Chris, do you have that on the next page? And yes, so, and when I, I click on that seven link, It'll take me directly to the grade seven uh, quick check. Go ahead, Kristen. Okay, so I think I'm going to take over at this point. So, um, okay. So we're kind of we we want to kind of give you some ideas on how these resources can be used, and you know what a teacher in the situation like what would be some possible strategies the teacher can use. So. In, in teaching 816A with slope, you know, identifying slope as positive, negative, or zero, and the whole idea of linear functions, it's really important that we know what our students are coming in with um, from seventh grade. You know, how much of seventh grade content are they coming in into uh, with, you know, in terms of under, understanding slope as a rate of change and understanding that proportional relationships can be written in the form y equals mx. So when I'm using the bridging document, I notice that 816 is in bold. So it's considered a bridging standard. So, and then when I click on 710A, I also realize 710A is considered a, a bridging standard. So it's really important that our students have a, a really strong grasp of these concepts. So I might decide to, because I really need to know what where my students are in terms of their understanding, I might decide to administer this quick 710A quick check um, to see where, you know, what, what the prerequisite knowledge is. So um, we wanted to kind of take a pulse check in terms of how many of you have used just-in-time quick checks and, and how familiar you are with them. And that will kind of give us an idea of how much detail we need to go into in terms of describing all the components. So we're gonna get we're gonna do a quick poll. Um, and I think um, Tina, you're gonna have to launch it. Um, I got it. I launched, launched it. it. Okay. So if you can answer more, you can put more than one selection. 
Um, but in what ways, you know, to what extent were you able to utilize the BDOE just in time mathematics quick check? So have, were you able to use them as pre-assessments to assess prerequisite skills, formative assessments to assess current grade level skills? Um, did you use them for planning for instruction or have you not had a chance to use these resources yet? We'll give you a minute or so to kind of uh, complete that poll and then we'll, we'll see what the results look like. So Kristen, we have about 75% of the participants have responded. So we'll wait um, maybe one more minute to get others to respond. Okay. So we're at about 82% right now, Kristen. Okay. I can't see the results, so you're going to have to verbalize them. <laughs> okay. Um, so I'm going to um, probably go ahead and end the poll. We're about at 85% and let you see the results. Um, so it looks like about 38% of you that are here have not used the just-in-time quick checks um, as of yet in your instruction. Um, and then about 29% of you, you have used them as pre-assessment for prerequisite skills, about 45% as formative assessment, and then 46% of you have also used them in planning. So again, the, the respondents um, could have picked more than one of those. But um, so that helps us a little bit to see that, you know, we have quite a few folks um, here today that, that don't know or haven't used the, this resource a lot. So what I did was I put a link, uh, since we're talking about 710A right now, I put a link in the chat that will go directly to the Word document of our quick check for 710A. So you can go ahead and, and click on that and download it so you can take a look at it while I talk about it. Um, and I'm going to pull mine over here so we can look at it at the same time. Uh, as long as my computer works. Oh, shoot. I just think I just might have closed it. Um, but as you're looking at the um, at the 710A, I think I accidentally closed the one I had open. Um, you'll notice that it has, um, you know, of course, the, the link at the top is to the curriculum framework. So, of course, that has all the more detailed information in terms of understanding the standard and so forth. And then it has standard of learning with, with what grade level skills associated with that standard of learning. The first link goes directly to the just-in-time questions. Um, and I believe that 710A has um, four questions. And then the next section, um, if you click on the just-in-time quick check teacher notes, you'll notice that it's a repeat of the questions, but then you'll see uh, some writing in red. And the, the, red, the red text is the teacher notes portion. And the teacher notes really dive into what are the common misconceptions and errors you might see uh, students displaying in those certain concepts. And then they also give suggestions for instructional strategies on how you can approach trying to you know, help them, uh, you know, extra, you know, dealing with the misconceptions. So um, they're really great resources. And we'll talk a little bit about how you can utilize them and when you should utilize them. And then you'll notice at the very bottom, it has the links, uh, it says supporting and prerequisite skills. And those all are linked to those quick checks. Um, and then um, a lot of teachers like to call these one-stop shopping because you'll notice there's a list of supporting resources. And those are all the supporting resources that VDO have, VDOE has in terms of supporting this particular SOL. So you'll notice that they link to our mathematics instructional plans. They link to our co-teaching math instructional plans. They link to our word wall cards, um, Desmos activities. So any, re or our rich mathematical tasks. So any resource that would support this SOL is listed on, on the just-in-time quick check. So again, it's a nice one-stop shopping. So as I was talking about, you know, if, if I'm getting ready to teach uh, at 816A with, you know, identifying positive, negative, and zero slopes, as well as um, graphing linear functions, 
I really want to know what my students understand about slope. I want to know if they understand that slope is rate of change and a proportional relationship. So here is one of the examples of one of the questions that's on 710A. I might decide I just want to just want to administer this one question to see what they understand about proportional relationships. Um, so you know you can choose to just choose just to give your students one of the questions from the quick check, or you can give them all the questions. They're they're, atten they're intended to be really flexible. So again, just kind of emphasizing what Tina talked about in the beginning is we really want, especially this year, we really want to focus on the whole idea of bridging to new learning and that whole idea of just in time. So integrating prerequisite skills just in time to support the current grade level learning. And our just in time quick checks really are very, very supportive of this goal. So if you haven't had a chance to use these, please, please use them this year. So it's just the whole idea, you know, we really want to do this just in time instruction and as opposed to what we would call just in case. So um, the original guidance that was developed right after the school closures in March of 2020, it was called the Recover, Redesign, Restart 2020. We called it the R, the R cube document. Talked about how, you know, formative assessment is going to be really, really key in, in terms of uh, planning our instruction and figuring out where our students are. So we don't, we really want to avoid having these huge, what we call testing events and just really rather focus on that ongoing formative or low stake assessments. And our just in time quick checks are really, really perfect for this goal. So we wanted to just give you an, uh, an example of, you know, we really want to focus on just in time, not just in case. So this teacher, Mrs. Merrick, is really using just-in-case instruction. So she's getting ready to teach SOL 816A. And just in case, she just did, she spends a whole block on teaching 710A, which is um, you know, identifying slope as rate of change and, and so forth. So she uses a whole block to teach that. And you know what? A lot of her students may have already had some really good background knowledge in that and didn't need that whole block of instruction. So she could, you know, that, that, you know, we don't really have any time to waste, especially this year. We want to be really strategic in how we use our time. So it's probably a better, in fact, it is a better idea to do the whole just in time as opposed to just in case. So rather than doing a just in case lesson, um, Mrs. Rodriguez decides to, to go ahead and give the quick check for 710A to, to see where her students are in terms of understanding slope as a rate of change and uh, writing proportional relationships with, an, with a Y equals MX equation. So she takes about 10 minutes to administer this quick check and she knows where her students are and that can really inform her instruction in terms of if she needs to provide additional reinforcement, it can inform instruction how she wants to form her small groups and so forth. So again, I kind of talked about this before, but these are really meant to be flexible. You can use one question at a time. You could use all the questions at a time. You really can do it at any point. The example I gave was I was using it as a pre-assessment, but they're great exit tickets. They're great to use formatively as you're teaching the current grade level lesson. Um, you can do them for warm-ups. Um, you can use them with just one student. You can use them with a the whole group. You can use them with small groups. So they're really, really meant to be flexible. So, so again, they help you, they help you identify those prerequisite skills that are necessary for that current uh, learning. They help you identify the common student errors and misconceptions. They definitely help you plan your instruction. Um, and really they're 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 quick checks. That's why they're called quick checks, because they can really help you quickly assess. Um, where your students are, whether it's, it's prerequisite skills or in their current learning. And then of course, the one-stop shopping has all the links to the resources that support that as well. Um, but we wanna, what we wanna make sure they're not used for is you, we don't wanna use them as a pre-assessment for your whole unit or for the whole semester or for the whole course. They're not meant to be that. We don't want them to be used as practice SOL tests. That's not the purpose of them. They're, they're, the purpose of them is to form it, you know, as a formative assessment to inform your instruction. 
Um, definitely don't want you to print them all out and staple them up and give them as packets. Um, they're not meant for independent learning. We don't want them to be used as graded assignments because the purpose of them is to inform your instruction and to identify where your students are and what their needs are. Um, and definitely don't use them for figuring out what course the students should be in, in terms of placement. So some of you already know, and for those of you who don't, we actually have all of the quick checks. So I, I showed you the Word form, the Word document form of the quick checks, but actually all of the quick checks have also been turned into a virtual form. Um, the secondary ones, the virtual form is in a Desmos activity. So there's actually a spreadsheet. We have them already vetted for kindergarten through algebra one, and then the geometry and algebra two ones should be ready very soon. Those are currently in the vetting process, um, but um, Tina or Deb will, will go ahead and put a link in the chat for the um, spreadsheet. Um, but the virtual quick check spreadsheet has a tab for each course. And then um, you can click on that link and it will take you directly to the Desmos activity. So we're gonna kind of think vertically still. So we talk, we were talking about 816A, which is um, identifying slope as positive, negative or zero and being neat and, and graphing linear functions. That vertically aligns when you look at the grade eight bridging document that vertically aligns with, um, with linear relationships in scatter plots and determining the slope of a line in algebra one, I'm sorry, it, it, horizontally connects with linear relationships and scatter plots in eighth grade, but in the future, it connects with determining the slope of a line for algebra one. So again, you can use, in particular, algebra one teachers can use the grade eight bridging documents uh, in terms of looking at the prerequisite skills for the algebra one, the current algebra one material. So we're actually going to have you all participate in the virtual format of the quick checks. And we're gonna ask you guys to pretend you're students for, for a few minutes. So we would like you to go to student.desmos.com and go ahead and type that code in. I'll give you a minute or two to kind of get into that and get into that activity. Kristen, I typed um, I typed the code in the chat too, so others will okay. have it as well. Let's see if I can pull over my screen. So we're thinking that most of you, especially because you're secondary teachers, there's probably there's more likelihood that you have experience with Desmos um, than our elementary group did. Um, but I'm going to kind of show you my screen as teacher while you all are starting to work on the activity. So this is the teacher dashboard. And the cool thing about the teacher dashboard is you can see all of your students work at the same time. Um, right now, I see all of your names. I see Mr. Nussbaum's name and Jordan's name and Jennifer's name. And some kids don't like to have their names shown in front of all the other kids. So that's the cool feature with the anonymize. I can anonymize the name and they then you all turn into famous mathematicians. Um, and I can see like where everybody is in terms of the, so this particular quick check has five, five questions. Um, and I can see that most people have, completed the first question or on the first, actually there's some people that are still on the first. So the blue, the blue tells me what question that student is on. And then the dots indicate that that student completed the question. And I can actually even click on the, the slide. So Tasha um, is on slide two. 
I'm sorry, yeah, on, on question one, and I can see what her work is. So I can see whether, you know, she understands how to find the slope when the, the, when the, the graph passes through negative two, one, and two, negative seven. Um, I can also click on the question and I can see everybody's answer and I get a, I just get a quick look at my, at my class's understanding of slope. You know, Ingrid actually showed how she figured it out. You know, some people have the simplified version of it. So this is just a really, this, I love Desmos because we, you can see your kids work all at the same time in real time. Um, let's see here. So the summary tab kind of shows all of your students at once. And then you can click on particular questions to see all of their answers at once, which is really cool. I'm sure you probably all know the pause button. A lot of kids get upset when they're paused because they're totally focused on doing the activity. Um, but you might be frustrated that I just stopped you from doing whatever you were doing. Um, you can pace so that push that kids can only do certain questions at a time or just a couple at a time before they can move on to another one. Um, I really like the snapshot feature where you can take pictures of uh, students' works, students' work, and then you can select and sequence in terms of discussing strategies and having uh, the discourse about the different strategies. So that's really neat as well. And I'm guessing you're probably a lot of you probably already know these features because you used us most. So I'm not going to spend a ton of time on it. The other really cool thing is that after the fact. If I want to really kind of take a look at the data and see where all, all of my individual students are, everything is saved. So I can go back to the teacher dashboard later and really look at my students' work. And, and that helps me kind of figure out where my students are, if I'm doing, if I'm planning on a small group instruction, which students are going to be in what group, and so forth. Hey, Kristen, a couple other things. I think that you mentioned that um, another teacher could get added to, to the same yes. um, activity or that another teacher's in, like for co-teaching and things. Yes, you can actually add, so two teachers can be on the same, can be, can be kind of controlling at the same time. So it's really great for co-teaching situations. Um, um, where both teachers can can see and we you know the special ed teacher this is great for progress monitoring um, and seeing the students work and you know helping form those small groups for your stations or for your parallel teaching or for your alternative teaching so yeah that's definitely another really great benefit of Desmos. So I think um, I'll let you guys keep playing with it if you haven't finished yet, but I think I showed most of these benefits of Desmos. Um, and like I said, you guys probably have more practice than I do because you use it all the time with your students, but Desmos, there's, there's so many benefits of Desmos. So if, if you haven't used it that much, I would definitely encourage you to, to really utilize it. Um, to help you this year with plan with uh, seeing where your students and that they're it's a great way to formatively assess. Oh, you know what I forgot to show? Um, that they sh they sh they show the teacher notes also. Let me pull this you know, over. Again. Kristen is pulling that up. Uh, do we still have the video uh, webinars of the videos? Uh, videos of the webinars. Yes. Yes. Um, the Desmos webinars on the website. Maybe we can post that uh, web page because I think that is very beneficial because one of our uh, high school teachers actually, uh, actually several high school teachers conducted those webinars for us last year. Yes, they're all still on our website and it shows there are some introductory videos that kind of just give you the basics on how to use Activity Builder and then there's videos that show you actually how to create activities. Um, but also I forgot to point out, um, you know, these are the Desmos versions of the quick checks. They also include the teacher notes. So when you click on the teacher moves, these are the teacher notes that um, I was telling you about on the Word document, all the teacher notes that were in red. Those teacher notes are actually written in the teacher move section. So you have those right there at your fingertips when you're using the virtual format. All right, so I think 
a lot of you probably know how to use the annotate tool in Zoom. If you don't, um, you should see a little bar at the top of your um, at the top of your window, and it'll probably say you are viewing Kristen Williams Foss's screen. And then if you click on view options and then click on annotate, it will give you options to use like little stickers or to draw. So I'd like you to use the annotate tool to just um, identify what is your favorite part about Desmos? Do you like that you can see the teacher notes for each question? Do you like that you can see your, that's an, oh, I didn't really mention that either. Like with Desmos, you, this, you can provide space for the students to explain their thinking, which is another really great feature. Um, I can look back, you know, look back at the teacher dashboard data. So what is your favorite part about this, about the Desmos activities? I would probably have a hard time picking one favorite. I would probably put mine right in the middle. Hey, Kristen, several folks um, that are on Chromebooks don't have access to the annotate tool. Um, so I just mentioned to have them put put what they um, want to want to choose in the uh, in the chat. Yeah, that's um, awesome. We just started using the annotate tool in some of our larger um, sessions recently, and and that's when we we realized that some of the the folks with Chromebooks um, don't don't have access to that feature in Zoom. So we apologize for that. All right, looks like we have a lot of uh, a lot of people putting checks and and stamps and in all the different sections. Like being able to provide the immediate feedback is really, yeah, Melissa said she used Desmos a lot last year and being able to provide, and yeah, and that's the cool, because even in a face-to-face -face classroom, with, if you have a, kit, a room of 25 students, you can't see everybody's work at once. You know, that's the cool thing about Desmos is you can see everybody's work right on that one screen. So even, even in a face-to-face -face session, or face-to-face -face classroom, you probably use Desmos a lot because you are able to really see everybody's work at once and that immediate feedback is really important. All right, let's see here. I'm going to clear our annotations and go to the next slide. Um, one other um, idea we wanted to share Kristen, with you. Kristen, can I, before you, Kristen, before you move on, mm -hmm. um, there was a question about um, whether or not the, are we saying that the VDOE stuff is, are provided, is already formatted into Desmos documents? So I think you might want to just reiterate yes, that so all of the quick checks for K through Algebra 1 are currently available as virtual Desmos activities. Mm -hmm. um, uh, geometry and Algebra 2 are currently being vetted. Those, those virtual versions are currently being finalized. Is that right, Tina? Yes. Yes, yes, Deb, that, that's correct. OK. So just wanted to clarify, and I'll put in the chat again, the virtual uh, uh, version. All right. Navanya awesome. said that she's coming back to teaching out of retirement. Bless your heart, Navanya. Oh my gosh, and yeah. And she's going to have to learn more about Desmos. So if you're willing to help Navanya, you know, please, please reach out because there's a, there's a, there's a lot to learn, but it's a super exciting uh, platform. But I'll have to say it's actually pretty user friendly and they have a lot of on the actual Desmos website, they have a lot of um, features, uh, tutorials and so forth that are really just easy to go through and learn how to do. And they're also really good about if you just email them, if you have any questions or good about responding to emails. So, um, so between the, the webinars that we have on our website and then all the tutorials they have on the Desmos site, it actually makes it a little bit easier to, to learn how to use it. Yeah, Rebecca also mentioned about our Desmos activity log, and um, we're going to be sharing the link to that in a little bit. Um, so um, that actually is um, a set of um, activities that are aligned to our standards of learning, um, because, you know, Desmos Activity Center has a ton of different activities, um, not just our video e quick checks, but lots of stuff. So we'll, we'll share that link um, soon. 
All right, we have one other quick activity to do with you and we're still kind of going along the same theme. So um, some of you are maybe familiar with this routine. So routines are a really great, a really great way to formatively assess and see what your students are coming into and what kind of knowledge they already have and understanding that they already have. So um, for those of you who have used which one doesn't belong, um, this is a great uh, routine that it can, it's quick, it's easy, it's accessible to all students, multiple entry points, there's not one right answer. Um, and, it, and it provides uh, opportunity for some really good math discourse. So those of you who liked using the annotate tool get to use it again. And I would like you to mark what graph you think does not belong. And again, if you can't, um, if you're not able to use the annotate feature, um, you know, please use the chat feature. That that uh, that would be great. And if you've come up with one that you think that you want to pick, and then you decide, oh well, maybe students would pick this other one. You might want to um, add another um, stamp to to the uh, the screen, or or type in a different um, choice. All right, I'm going to ask you for your justifications in just one minute. So just hold on for one second before you start putting stuff in the chat, just because I, I, I can't read the chat that fast. <laughs> All right, so it looks like a lot of you chose the bottom right hand corner. Um, so if you chose the bottom right hand corner, go ahead and type your justification in the chat. Why did you choose the bottom right? It's the only one that has a negative slope, slope says Denise. Only one with a negative slope. Negative slope, negative slope. Any other reasons besides negative slope? So most, most of you pick that one because it's negative slope, slope down instead of up. Any other reason? So this would be a great uh, chance. And of course, since we have so many people on this call, we're, we're, we're putting our answers into the chat, but this is where we would want students to unmute and, and, and share their reasoning. So, and this would be a great opportunity. You know, a lot of you put negative slope. You would have, you could have a discussion about well, what is slope? What does that mean? Um, what do you mean that it's negative? And you can really get a good sense of students' understanding of vocabulary terms. Quad, Allison mentioned quadrants. We can talk about what are quadrants. You know, how do you know they're two one? You know, the, and just there's so many different discussions with vocabulary and understanding that you can have as students are justifying their reasoning. What about um, let's let's go to the bottom left. So if you chose the bottom left, what was your reasoning for the bottom left? Skyler said it doesn't cross the x-axis. So we could talk about well where. What do you mean by the x-axis? Where is the x-axis? A negative y-intercept. Jordan, what is, what is a y-intercept? What does that mean? And, and what does it mean when it's negative? Um, so there's so many different um, discussions you can have with, with and as long as this, the student can justify why they chose it, you know, there's, that's what's really cool about these is there's, there's more than one answer. Um, all the other graphs have a y-intercept of a positive, and this graph has the only negative y-intercept. All right, how about, I only see a couple people chose the top left. So if you, actually it looks like three people chose the top left. Who chose the top left? Can you write your reasoning in the chat? It has a negative x-intercept. So then we can talk about what do you, what's the difference between the x-intercept and the y-intercept? You can talk about the coordinates. Um, it never enters the fourth quadrant. Awesome. And all the other ones, so that where we could talk about well, which one is the fourth quadrant and can you justify that all the other ones do enter the fourth quadrant? Awesome. 
So um, this is just a, you know, another quick routine that's, that's simple to administer. If you've never had an opportunity to go to this website, which one does not belong, we have the link here. Um, and there's tons of them for all grade levels. Um, and so they're really they're just quick and easy. And so if you're an algebra one teacher, you know, getting ready to teach algebra or A6, you could do this as a warm up and really kind of get a sense of what your students understand in terms of slope, negative, positive slopes, no slopes, zero slopes, linear functions from all the prerequisite uh, material from eighth grade. All right, I think it's time to clear. I think the annotate tool helps you find the artists in your in your audience too. Mm -hmm. so a few artists out there. Definitely. So we're actually going to share uh, the link to the slideshow. Um, so that you can access this presentation um, because we want you to be able to access these resources that we're going to talk about. So if you go to this link, this should take you to the presentation. And we are on, let's see what slide number are we on, 41? So go ahead and access this presentation and go to slide 41, that's where we are. Um, but try not to click on any links yet until I finish explaining them. I know it might be tempting. Um, so, you know, thinking about this coming school year, you know, it's gonna be even more challenging than last year and unprecedented. And we have a lot of things to think about in terms of making sure we address unfinished learning and try to really think about what our students' strengths are coming in, helping them have a positive math mindset, helping them feel like they can do math and they like math. And so there's really some good recommendations that we really need to take into consideration when we're thinking about this whole idea of bridging unfinished learning to new learning. Um, this, this chart, um, actually the uh, information came from Achieve the Core and we have a link to this resource and the presentation, but they did a really good job of providing recommendations of what we should do and maybe some missteps that we should try to avoid. So we're just gonna kind of go through the recommendations and also share what VDOE resources would support these recommendations. So rather than just blindly adhering to a pacing guide, which you really shouldn't do anyway, but even more importantly not do this year, we really wanna use that formative data to gauge where our students are in their understanding and to really help inform our pacing. So resources that would support that, of course, are the just-in-time math quick checks, which we've spent some time with. And then if you haven't had a chance to use any of our algebra readiness formative assessment items, those have some really great questions too for formative assessment. And they go from grades five all the way up to algebra one. Um, you know, we wanna do that just in time support, which we've been talking about really throughout this whole presentation. We don't wanna stop our current instruction to do a review of a whole unit from the grade before. We wanna do that just in time support. Um, so we're strategic about folding the previous content into our current instruction for the current unit. So again, our just-in-time mathematics quick checks are very supportive of that recommendation. Um, it's going to be, you know, we're not going to be able to address every single student, every single student gap. Um, so we really need to be strategic and we really need to prioritize the most essential and pre pre most essential prerequisite skills. And that's where our bridging documents will really be helpful. I'm going to the next slide. You know, sometimes it's hard to figure out how far, how far we should go back in the learning progression. And you kind of want to have the whole Goldilocks ideal. You want to go back just far enough to, to give access to the student for the, the current grade level. Um, and again, our just-in-time math quick checks will support that goal, as well as um, Tina had mentioned this earlier, our MVAT, the Mathematics Vertical Articulation Tool, has all that vertical articulation from previous and future contents going from kindergarten all the way through Algebra 2. 
Um, we don't want to use strategies that weren't effective the first time. And, and again, you know, we really need, it's going to be, it's going to be kind of our, our, own, our challenge to make sure that our students um, are experiencing success. You know, a lot of our students had a, had a rough year last year and they may not have the best mindset about math. They may not have had the best mindset to start with, but then, you know, their last year's experience, they just, they might, so it's, they might not have that great of a mindset coming in. So it's really important to try to re-engage them and help them believe that they're mathematicians and that they, that they can do math and that they're a math person and really support that agency and identity. So we wanna to try to use strategies that will help re-engage them in the, in the math learning. So our math instructional plans are great for that. Our co-teaching math instructional plans, um, if you haven't had a chance to check those out, they also provide suggestions for specially designed instruction, um, as well as accommodations and modifications. Um, our rich mathematical tasks, um, we have several of those um, for all grade levels from kindergarten through algebra two that are, um, you know, those, those tasks that have multiple entry points, uh, and you can use multiple solution strategies, and, you know, so they're really accessible to all learners. And then like, like we talked about uh, a little bit already, you know, it, intervention programs, whether the intervention is being provided during the class time or it's provided at a different time during the day or if it's before school or after school, you don't want to, you don't want to provide intervention on totally separate content. You want it to be supportive of whatever content they're learning in their grade level class so that they can make those connections. Um, and our algebra readiness plans are very supportive of that as well. So those, you know, those plans could could support uh, what the instruction that's going on during that grade level class. Um, when we're choosing our intervention, again, we just need to be so strategic. We need to think about what you know, what is the current grade level learning, and what are those most essential prerequisite skills that I want to make sure my students have a grasp of. Um, again, our bridging documents are very supportive of that, as well as our tracking logs. And then lastly, and Tina kind of alluded this to this earlier, you know, we don't want to do everything in that procedural step-by-step -step way. We want to make sure we're connecting the conceptual to the procedural, and we really want to make sure that we're considering the level of rigor in, in the tasks that we decide and the activities that we decide to do. Um, so the mathematics curriculum framework is always a good resource in terms of identifying the level of rigor. And then, of course, our rich mathematical tasks, tasks are also a good resource. Is there anything that came up in the chat, Tina or Deb, that we should address before we move on? I don't see anything. I know Jordan mentioned that she the, the rich mathematical tasks are awesome. So we're, we're glad that they're, they're being used. Um, but I don't see anything else, Kristen. Okay. All right. So I know you guys are probably tired of hearing my voice. So um, we want to give you a chance to kind of engage in some of these resources. We know that some of you have um, had experience with some of the resources, or maybe some of the resources are new to you. Some others of you may, you know, a lot of them might be new to you. So we're gonna give you an opportunity to go into breakout rooms. And what we're gonna ask you to do is of course, first introduce yourself to each other, you know, what your role is, where you're from. Um, and then, the, you know, looking at slides, these last three slides that we just, that we just went through, like kind of checking out the resources, they, they all have the links. So kind of just check out the resources that you're maybe not as familiar with. And then take some time to talk to each other about, well, how could you use these resources in your particular setting and kind of share ideas with each other? So I think I'm- I, I did create um, 20 breakout rooms already. So okay. I, think, I think that we might be ready. All right, awesome. Okay. And if, you're, if you forget what you're supposed to do, the slide is there that tells you what to do, so. But be sure to introduce yourselves to each other and talk a little bit about where you're from and what you all are doing, because networking is, is, is an important part of, of getting in the breakout rooms. Okay, here we go.
We hope that you are able to um, to network a little bit with some of your colleagues, uh, some that may not need, be in the same division or maybe across the state from you and, um, and learn a little bit about some of how they're using um, resources this year. Uh, we wanted to end out our time with you tonight just to share a few additional resources um, that, that are available. Uh, we've talked a lot tonight about the VDOE just-in-time quick checks, um, and we advised you about the vetted virtual formats. Um, again, reminding you that the geometry and the algebra 2 are in their final stages of vetting and should be available very soon. Um, and I believe Kristen um, had put a, a link in the chat to, uh, to that vir virtual format, but you can also um, get it on the Quick Check webpage um, by using that link and uh, you should be able to see it. It is um, in the form of an Excel spreadsheet. So you'll have to go to the tab at the bottom to find um, the grade level that you're, that you're choosing. Uh, another resource that we wanted to share, um, we talked a little bit, Kristen talked about the algebra readiness resources, and this is somewhat of a, of a hidden uh, resource that, that uh, some people don't know about, but we do have uh, formative assessment items um, and some plans for intervention or remediation that you can use. Um, so, so if you're not familiar with those, please check, check those out. Um, they're very helpful for um, our middle school and algebra one teachers in particular. Um, we talked a little bit about this Desmos activity log in the chat, and um, this is a link to that activity log. It does include um, Desmos activities that have been um, posted on their activity center that are um, aligned. We aligned them to the standards of learning. Um, so the, this, again, is another Excel spreadsheet that you can open and go to the tab or the grade level of your choice and click on the link, and it should take you straight to um, the activity. Um, again, if you're you know, a teacher. I, did, oh. Oh, I was so. just going to say that I did put the link to the Desmos webpage because it does include all of those great webinars that were held. Um, for those people who might be getting started with Desmos uh, for the first time or new teachers, um, it includes that activity log as one of the resources on that page, but it also has a lot, lot more that you might enjoy. Yeah, yeah, I put that link in earlier, Deb, but thank you for including it again, because um, there is there are a lot of great resources. It also links um, to the Virginia uh, Desmos calculators. There's links there as well. So. Um, that should be helpful. We did have a team working to update this um, activity log for the Desmos, um, and we will be posting that um, towards the end of the month. Um, if, if you um, if you're a K through um, eight teacher, we have been working with George Mason University on some additional bridging um, resources. Uh, we're excited on. Um, I think it's August 31st. We're going to be. Um, giving a webinar to introduce folks to these resources. Uh, we've had a cadre of Virginia teachers that have worked on these um, throughout the summer, and we're excited to, to, to bring those to you. So there's some um, registration for that um, has been announced in Teacher Direct, and I believe we have the links for the registration on the very next page. Um, but this, um, the resources basically are aligned um, from one grade level to the next. So if you're an eighth grade teacher bridging from seventh grade and you're teaching, um, again, that, that concept of, of slope, um, there's a just-in-time quick check that's included. And then there's suggestions for classroom routines, for different games, for tasks, and then some more resource links um, that, that, that are particular to that particular link and bridge of, of content. And so these are the uh, the links to the webinars um, that, that we're going to be holding and a little description of, of what those um, those bridging documents will include. Again, we, we discussed at the beginning of the session that this is a, in a, went first in a series of webinars, our fall math webinar series. We, and in late September or early October, plan to have a using small group instruction um, to address unfinished learning uh, session. And then in mid-October, you'll be able to join us for planning intervention strategies uh, to bridge to new learning. So we, we look forward to hopefully having you join us for some of those. And that registration is available on Teacher Direct. If you're a teacher and you're not signed up for Teacher Direct, it is um, a VDOE listserv. And um, if you sign up, you get an email every um, Wednesday. And it just shares information um, about um, happenings um, 
at the at the state level, uh, not only with mathematics, but with with other disciplines, uh, scholarship opportunities, lots of information is shared through the through teacher direct. So we would encourage you to uh, to get on there and, uh, and register for that. Uh, Kristen, I think just put the link in the chat. So as we close out our time with you tonight, we would love to hear after um, sharing a lot of the different resources and ideas with you, what is your next step now in planning to address student unfinished learning? So if you could put your answer to that in the chat um, before you head out for the evening, uh, Kristen and Deb and I will be hanging out for a few minutes to answer any questions that you may have. So you can feel free to put those in the chat or you can just hang on and open your mic and we'd be happy to chat with you a little bit. Um, but again, just put your, um, your answer before you leave in, in the chat box about how you plan on uh, taking next steps to address unfinished learning. Thank you for joining us um, this evening. We've loved um, spending this time with you. We wish you um, well as you plan for the new school year. Um, please be safe and uh, have a wonderful evening. Thank you. <laughs>